Welcome, and thank you for standing by. Participants over the phone lines are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's event. At that time, you may press star 1 on your touchtone phone if you would like to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect. You will hear music until we begin at top of the hour. Please stand by. everyone and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. My name is Josh Handel and I'll be your host for today's briefing. As a reminder to folks in the room, please ensure that your phones are silenced during the duration of the call. NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, is the world's first ever mission to test a technology for defending Earth against potential asteroid or comet hazards. DART is a first-of-its-kind spacecraft that will autonomously navigate to a target asteroid and intentionally collide with it to change the asteroid's motion in a way that can be measured using ground-based telescopes. While DART's target asteroid is not a threat to our planet, this test will see if asteroid deflection using a kinetic impactor spacecraft is a viable way to respond to a future asteroid on a collision course with Earth should one ever be discovered. And I'm joined today by some of the executive senior leadership and mission experts that are helping to make DART possible. We'll quickly hear from our expert panel to learn more about their specific roles on DART, and then we'll jump into the Q&A portion during today's uh, conference. For folks in the room, once we begin our Q&A portion, please raise your hand if you have a question, and I will call on you. We do also have reporters dialed into the phone bridge, and we'll be taking questions from them as well as they come in. I'll now turn it over to Thomas Zerbukin. Associate Administrator for Science at NASA for some quick opening remarks. Well, uh, Josh, thank you so much, and I couldn't be more excited to be here. Uh, just days before uh, the day that we've been waiting for, for 10 months or so, and actually for several years, uh, a team that has been getting us ready uh, to do this. And it would be a huge mistake to not point out that today is a huge anniversary uh, for all of space, uh, kind of technology, space science, uh, 10 a.m. local time in Texas in Rice Stadium in front of 40,000 people. President Kennedy gave a speech. Uh, you know, those of us who give speeches, we know most of these speeches are forgotten uh, two minutes after we leave the podium. Not in this case. Uh, many of us can recite some of the sentences of the speech uh, for many of us uh, had, you know, that carry inspiration today. We choose to go to the moon. You know, as a nation, it's not because it's easy, it's because it's hard. Uh, there's one part in there uh, that I want to read uh, for you today, which says, we set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained, and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. And that's the theme for today that I want to put in front of us, uh, for the progress of all people, are so many of the uh, space missions that we have, whether it's the two dozens or so of Earth science missions that are up there, two of them still to be launched before the end of the year, one of them looking at uh, water, whether it's uh, seawater, but also uh, waters kind of uh, in lakes and uh, uh, all over the world with enough spatial resolutions, what, together with the 
French Space Agency, or JPSS, which is uh, one of our missions together with NOAA, that, of course, the moment it is up there and it is put in place, will help add to the weather forecast that all of us will benefit from it because of that, because of the fact that it's a low, low a LEO emission. Uh, actually, the whole, you know, inhabitants of the entire world will benefit from that as we're sharing data with other uh, countries. Earth science uh, is really helping, protecting, and improving life on Earth every day. Uh, as, are, is, uh, as a technological society, our space weather missions. Uh, we just uh, talked about the fact that the uh, solar orbiter just had a Venus flyby, and kind of, uh, right in the middle of that Venus flyby, there was a solar storm, and a solar storm that had at its origin uh, very close to Parker Solar Probe, which is right now in a perihelion pass. Parker Solar Probe, of course, also run by your team, uh, Bobby, and uh, you know, together with NASA. And, uh, you know, again, space weather, uh, kind of protecting and improving life on Earth because as a technological society. And then there is, you know, planetary defense. Uh, these objects that are hurling through space and have, of course, scarred the face of the moon and over time uh, also on Earth have had major impact, have affected our history. And for the first time in the series of new missions that uh, we put in place, are actually helping us understand and quantify those uh, threats in an unprecedented fashion and with DART, a first mission to actually uh, try to uh, really bump out of the way uh, an object of threat, kind of in a direct, in a direct um, uh, you know, experiment. In this particular case, uh, as you said, uh, the body that we're going after is not a threat to the Earth, but what we're trying to do is learn about uh, doing these collisions uh, in a way that actually helps us in the future potentially. Of course, right behind it is another mission, Neo Surveyor, that actually helps us look at objects that are dark, uh, kind of where you really need an infrared uh, type of camera, but also objects that are in areas of the sky that otherwise could not be seen from Earth just because our geometry of the sun and the Earth and kind of can't really see in the morning and the evening all that well. There's certain uh, certain uh, areas in in space that are not there. So we're really looking forward uh, to DART. I look forward to uh, the discussions here. I just want to tell you on behalf of uh, all of our NASA leadership how excited we are to be there. Uh, there's many things I love about DART, not just uh, its prime purpose. I love also that it was packed with full of technologies that went out there and actually not only enhanced the spacecraft itself, but all the spacecraft to follow, because we're trying to actually, kind of, if you want, add more tools to the bucket of tools that we have available for future missions. And, and as we go through the day, we're also going to talk about this. I want to tell you, and um, this is going to be uh, discussed later, and Josh told me I should uh, mention it, I'm happy to, is that uh, yesterday evening I got an email that said that Leisha Cube was deployed and was subsequently acquired uh, with, uh, with one of the Deep Space Network antennas. And uh, I just want to tell you that, of course, uh, we can have a successful DART mission without that uh, CubeSat, but uh, I'm very excited that it's out there and flying because we want to see some amazing pictures, uh, some of the last pictures of DART uh, right there from that little CubeSat that uh, is a technology that uh, something like 10, 15 years ago seemed crazy to be used in that kind of context. So that's what this mission is about, and what I'd like to do is kick it back to you, Josh. Thank you, Thomas. Next, we'll hear from Bobby Braun, head of the Space Exploration Sector here at APL. Thanks, Josh. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Bobby Braun, uh, head of the Space Exploration Sector here at the Applied Physics Laboratory, and I'd like to take a moment to welcome you to the lab and uh, put the DART mission in a little bit of context. Uh, DART is joining a long list of APL space firsts, uh, from the first picture of Earth from space in 1946 to the navigation satellites that were the precursors to GPS in the 1960s to the first spacecraft to Mercury, uh, Pluto, and one that's even touched the sun this century. And now it's DART's turn. This inaugural planetary defense test mission marks a major moment in human history. For the first time ever, we will measurably change the orbit of a celestial body in the universe. Doing so has clear benefits in ensuring humanity's ability to deflect a potential 
threatening asteroid in the future. It also speaks volumes to how far our space program has come in just the last 60 years and how important the space program can be to all of us here on the Earth. APL provides a unique mix of space know-how in both civilian and national security missions. And learning and transferring technology across these sectors, it's this very perspective that has allowed DART to come to fruition. Having started at APL earlier this year, I can tell you that what I found is a team here that is peerless when it comes to technical acumen, passion, daring, and drive. And uh, this first planetary defense mission, it requires the first ever planetary defense team. And so I'm proud to be here today uh, representing the hundreds of people across our nation that have helped make this mission possible. And people I'm hoping that throughout the course of the next few weeks, as we get to that encounter itself, that you'll get to meet. Thank you for coming out today, and thank you to NASA for uh, challenging our team in this special way. Back to you, Josh. Thank you, Bobby. We'll now hear from Andrea Riley, the DART program executive at NASA. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Riley. Uh, I'm the program executive at NASA headquarters, uh, working with the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. Um, at NASA, we established the Planetary Defense Coordination Office uh, in 2016 to help manage NASA's ongoing uh, efforts of finding, tracking, characterizing, and if necessary, planning mitigation uh, for any near-Earth asteroid or comet that uh, has the potential to impact Earth. As mentioned, DART will be humanity's first ever planetary defense test. And the DART demonstration of technology to deflect an asteroid is one we believe is important to conduct uh, before there's an actual need uh, is discovered. So while DART's target does not pose a threat to Earth, um, this mission and demonstration will give planetary defense experts um, more confidence that this is a viable mitigation technique should uh, we ever uh, discover a need, need that we need to use it. Um, so DART is an exciting mission, and I'm thrilled that you're here today to hear from this expert panel of um, folks uh, to hear about the mission and the technologies uh, making it happen. Thank you, Andrea. We'll now go to Patrick Hill, Civil Space Program Area Manager here at APL. Thanks, Josh. Um, my name is Patrick Hill. I am the uh, Program Area Manager for Civil Space. This includes our portfolio of planetary science and planetary defense projects. Uh, so that includes projects similar to uh, New Horizons, which you're all familiar with, it's the incredible flyby of Pluto. And we're currently developing the Dragonfly mission, which will take an optocopter to Titan, one of the moons of, of Saturn. Um, I'm definitely here and uh, happy to be here to share some of the incredible technologies um, and in addition to the smart nav, which is the, our enabling technology, which will allow us to track the asteroid and, and uh, impact it. But I did want to highlight some things like the ROSA or rollout solar arrays. Those are the distinctive solar arrays that are basically dwarf the spacecraft itself. And we'll kind of talk about those as we kind of go through the, uh, the press briefing. So glad to be here with you today. Thank you, Patrick. We'll now go to Evan Smith, the DART Deputy Mission Systems Engineer here at APL. Thank you, Josh. Uh, my name is Evan Smith. I'm a Deputy Mission System Engineer. Uh, so I'm part of the technical leadership team of the DART project. So I'll be walking you guys through the 24-hour timeline later of everything to expect on our way to make uh, our first foray into planetary defense happen. So. Thank you, Evan. We'll now hear from Michelle Chen, SmartNav Lead here at APL. Hi, my name is Michelle Chen. Um, I am the lead engineer for SmartNav, and SmartNav stands for Small Body Maneuvering Autonomous Real-Time Navigation. Um, as Patrick and Bobby both said, this is one of the technology demonstrations, and we are so excited about it. It's two weeks away, so now my heart rate has increased a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. And now we'll hear from Nancy Chabot, Dark Coordination Lead at APL. Thanks. 
Um, Nancy Schwedt, our coordination lead here at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, I guess I was told to say a few words just about how will we know this worked. Um, so I'll kind of pick it up from there um, and we can take questions. But uh, one of the first things we'll know is that these Draco images that uh, Michelle was talking about with SmartNav are going to be coming back to Earth at one per second in real time during the actual impact event. Um, they're going to be really exciting. Uh, it's going to start off as a little point of light and then eventually it's going to zoom and fill the whole entire field of view of the images that return. You'll be able to see things at tens of centimeters per pixel and these images will continue until they don't. So that'll be a pretty uh, definitive look into the final moments of the DART spacecraft. But Leachia Cube that we heard about that deployed successfully will make its close pass three minutes later. And it's equipped with two cameras that are going to capture direct images of DART's collision and then the ejecta, the pulverized rock that's thrown off during this collision. And, uh, but Leachia Cube stores its data, so we won't get those in real time on the actual time of the event. They'll come back in the days and weeks and months that follow after there. We'll also have some uh, telescopes uh, around the world and in space that will be looking at the collision both before and uh, after. And they might immediately see some brightening because of this ejecta, and that will also be a good indication that this um, whole collision happened. But none of these things that I've mentioned are actually going to tell us how much we deflected the asteroid. You have to use the telescopes here on Earth in order to make that measurement. So telescopes here on Earth discovered this Didymos asteroid system back in 1996. They've been studying it for decades. Very precisely, we know that right now it takes 11 hours and 55 minutes to go around. DART's collision is expected to change that just slightly, a bump, like uh, Dr. Zubukin described it as. It's only about a 1% change, but maybe 11 hours and 45 minutes going forward. And these telescopes will need to take data for the weeks after DART's collision in order to make that measurement very precisely and figure out how effective was this deflection. And I'll just add, it doesn't really, um, well, Combined with the telescopes, um, it really is an international issue for planetary defense. We actually have telescopes on all seven continents that are involved in the DART observation campaign, as well as telescopes in space that are involved. So we're really bringing all resources to bear on this problem. And we've got scientists um, around the world, actually, who are bringing state-of-the-art models because this isn't just a one-off event. We want to know what happened to Dimorphos, but more important, we want to understand what that means for potentially applying this technique in the future. The DART investigation team members represent over 100 different institutions covering 27 different countries, and really by embracing this international cooperation for this international issue, we're able to maximize what we get from this opportunity to do this first planetary defense technology mission. Um, really excited about this. People across the world are excited about this, so happy to be here today. Thank you very much, Nancy and everyone. We're now ready to begin the Q&A portion of the event. As a reminder for folks in the room, if you have a question, please raise your hand. If you would like to ask a question over the telephone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Your name is needed to introduce your question. Again, to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1. Um, uh, in terms of uh, how the impact will uh, affect um, Dimorphos in its internal composition and porosity, and uh, what the unknowns are, and 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 how much it might vary by the the, the orbital period, and what you what science you'll learn from that. Okay. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, what we've seen from other missions that have gone to other asteroids, right, is this is why we need to be doing this on an asteroid of an actual scale in space on this test. Um, and so this combined information from the Draco images, we don't know what Dimorphos looks like. This is going to be the first time we even see what this asteroid looks like. How rocky is it? How smooth is it? Um, and then Leachia Cube with the ejecta that comes off, that's a very important constraint with um, how much the rocky material is shot off the surface, that relates to the porosity, that relates to the internal strength of the object, um, and then how much you actually moved it, the period change. All of that will feed into these models, and it will tell you information then about the strength and the internal composition um, and what that means for Dimorphos, but more generally what that means for applying this technique in the future. Um, I'll also just add that the European Space Agency has the HERA mission, which will follow on a few years later and be able to get the mass of Dimorphos. And, and really, this is an international collaboration you know, in order to get the most out of there. So I, I probably could go on and on about the science that we're going to learn and how it's important for understanding our solar system and for applying it for planetary defense, but maybe that answered your question sufficiently. So thanks. 
Thank you, Nancy. And as a reminder to the panel, please identify yourself so that our uh, remote reporters can, can know who to attribute quotes to. Uh, Kristen Fisher with CNN. As somebody who uh, is going to have to likely cover this uh, on live television the evening of the 26th, I'd love to just get a bit more detail into what exactly we can expect to see uh, live that evening. I know, Nancy, you kind of talked about this, but you know, is it mostly control room shots? Are we going to be able to get any images or uh, things from the, from the CubeSat that uh, Dr. Z was talking about, or is this all stuff that we're going to have to wait a, a, a few weeks for? Uh, so any guidance on that, just greatly appreciated for whoever wants it. I mean, the Draco images, the plan is, and maybe I'll let Michelle jump in here a little bit about SmartNav, um, but uh, these images come back to Earth at one per second, and the plan is to broadcast them live on the NASA TV broadcast. And like I said, these will be Pretty stunning. Michelle, do you want to give us a description of what this is going to look like for the last hour of the mission? <clears throat> well, for the last hour, starting out of an hour, um, it might be hard to see the actual asteroid that we're looking to hit, the Morphus. Um, and then, really, it will start feeling the, filling the field of view of Draco camera um, at about you know two minutes out and and closer. So um, it's. I mean, we're. Like Nancy said, we have not we seen it, so we are honestly super excited to see what it's going to look like. And um, and I think related to SmartNav, one of the things that we've been able to do with Smart Labs is we've been simulating what the asteroids could look like and different shapes um, using existing asteroids that we've already seen and using that to test our robustness to finding Dimorphos and hitting Dimorphos. And Evan, do you want to say a little bit about what's going to be going on uh, in the mission operations? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Evan Smith, Deputy Mission System Engineer. So uh, last four hours, we're going to something called the terminal terminal phase of the mission. So this is kind of we're going for Didymos, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that Draco stays pointed at Didymos and Dimorphos is the system, and that we're heading in there. So at that point, we are doing no more planned ground commands, and it is all autonomous onboard spacecraft control. So SmartNav taking the wheel and steering us in. At that point, at four hours, we are actually targeting Didymos because we can't see Dimorphos. And we're going to continue to target Didymos all the way until about 50 minutes to impact. At 50 minutes to impact, we'll, we will have been uh, seeing Dimorphos for maybe 40 minutes, something like that. Uh, and we will transition our quarter of a degree field of view slightly over. So actually, both objects will still be in the field of view, but we're going to go straight toward Dimorphos and go for impact on there. Uh, so that's at 50 minutes to impact. That's a very, um, very sweaty time for us. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of contingencies built right around that 50-minute transition. We're going to be watching the telemetry like hawks, uh, very scared but excited. Um, and then from there, at 20 minutes to impact, we're going to something called precision locked, which we totally ignore Didymos, and we just go for dimorphous only. Uh, we expect to be thrusting quite a bit at that period. At two and a half minutes to impact, we cut off all thrusting, and we're going to coast in. Uh, we're going to be streaming images the whole time. So images are coming in through Draco, through our avionics, and right out the radio. We expect the, the data to only be on board for less than two seconds, uh, and then the DSN will receive it. We'll get it on the ground, and um, we will celebrate a successful conclusion to the mission. Thank you. And this is Josh. I'll just jump in as a reminder. Live coverage of that does start at 6 p.m. on NASA TV with impact expected to occur at 7.14 p.m. on the 26th. Mind if I just uh, add a couple comments, comments here? Um, uh, the first one is I want to point out uh, the challenge for the Deep Space Network system for this one. Uh, if you look at uh, landing on Mars, if you land on Mars, uh, frankly, it lands whether you watch or not. And assume everything goes well, uh, you can get the data back the next day if you miss the pass. That's not the case here. There's nothing to watch. <laughs> Assuming everything goes well, kind of a few seconds after the uh, impact, there's nothing to watch. So I just really want to make sure that everybody understands kind of how important it is that for the whole ecosystem to really uh, focus on that, especially in this case, 
the Deep Space Network system, which of course is uh, over the time is including everybody, uh, all the stations uh, uh, around the Earth, the three stations. So that's number one. The, the question you also ask is what will we see kind of about the impact? And, and, and frankly, I think where, where you should air right now is basically assume you will not see the impact other than uh, through the amazing footage that was just described right now, kind of the, from the camera itself. But uh, wait, uh, and, you know, for, for us, I think the, the principle we have here, and I think you described it really well, we gave ourselves many chances to get lucky. Uh, looking from many different directions. We just have to see. I mean, uh, just everybody uh, should expect that, uh, look, trying, but, uh, but uh, you know, if I was in a live broadcast, I would not promise that, just because I don't think that's a requirement at all. We're just going to try, and frankly, we're turning every head we can, uh, you know, from James Webb Space Telescope to, uh, to uh, ground-based uh, systems and so forth. So, so to, to try to capture a glimpse of, uh, of, uh, of the, the whole process here. But none of that will be live. Exactly right. Be exactly right. But, you know, I mean, I, I look forward to the ground-based people who are saying, hey, what happened here? It will not be live, as you said. Thank you. Sorry, please raise your hand. Sorry, James Hamill, <laughs> yep. your English. Oh, about how long would the turnaround be for TV purposes? I mean, what are we likely to be able to show? So the Draco images, I just want to stress, I think are going to be pretty spectacular. Like, you're going to be coming into an asteroid that nobody's ever seen before, and you're going to see things that are tens of centimeters in size for that final image, and then it's going to cut off, right? I mean, so I think that's going to be pretty cool. And, uh, and like uh, Evan was describing, it's really an important, intense moment to do this smart nav. You can't distinguish Dimorphos from Dimitis until this last hour of the mission. All of that's on the broadcast. All of that's in there. So, um, oh, sorry, Nancy Chabot, um, APL. Uh, Leech Cube is going to take these images and store them on board. Um, they were successfully deployed, and so their stuff will come down in the next days. Um, the telescopes, if they get any brightening or stuff, I'm sure that NASA will move to share that as soon as it's practical. Um, the telescopes, to make this measurement of how much we've deflected it, really are going to take more like weeks in order to have that answer um, of how much we move this, and that's just because they need to measure this orbital period over and over again and see what that changes. Um, and the moon gets in the way sometimes for ground-based observing. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Hello, uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com. I've got, I think, one and a follow-up. For, for Nancy, what are the space telescopes that we'll be watching in addition to the ones on the ground? And then I think for, for Michelle and for Evan, this sounds like a super challenging, like, make it or break it attempt here. I mean, is it like hitting a hole in one in LA from, like, New York? Or can you kind of weigh, like, exactly how challenging this is going to be, uh, maybe, and how, how fast you, you're hoping to be able to, to hit the uh, dimorphos, how big it is, you know, or, or for what you think right now, and, and uh, just kind of those, those, those odds right now. Well, this is Nancy. Mine is really short. Uh, there's JWST, Hubble, and also the Lucy spacecraft um, are going to be operating in space. So over to you guys with these cool analogies. Evan Smith, Deputy Mission yeah. System Engineer. All right, so, um, yeah, I mean, this is incredibly challenging. So Didymos, or Dimorphos, well, Didymos is a kilometer across. That's pretty small. Dimorphos, 120 meters, 160 meters, somewhere in there. Uh, I mean, we can't see it until an hour and a half before we get there. So we're flying in something that it takes 38 seconds for us just to communicate one way with this thing, more than a minute to get a full round-trip light time to get a command there and back. So we have that. Um, I mean, we have an amazing imager, but like I said, it's a quarter of a degree field of view that we're trying to keep on an object that is thousands of kilometers away, uh, all the way through impact. Um, so I think, yeah, and we're, we talked about speed, so we're coming in at six kilometers per second. And uh, this is, uh, I think that we said we could get from uh, D.C. to Philly in, you know, like 40 seconds or something like that. This is a number that I will need to be fact-checked on. Uh, you guys can do it pretty easily on your iPhone calculators. So I would encourage that. Um, but, yeah, there's just an incredible amount of technical hurdle, hurdles here, keeping all the systems online up and running. 
Um, I mean, you have, you're, you're taking these images, you're bringing them down to the ground in one stream and another stream, you're dissecting them on board with an FPGA that's never been flown in space before. So you're running these uh, blobbing and centroiding al algorithms and running them through these uh, filters that have only been used on missile, de missile defense. Um, so this is uh, an incredibly challenging problem that we're very excited to tackle and uh, very hopeful. Um, and as much as we've all talked about it, I mean, this is a, this is a par one course, so uh, we're going in for the, the hit this time. Um, we do have an opportunity coming up in two years, but we don't want to play that round, round of golf. We're going to stick with this one. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll now take a few questions uh, from our remote reporters. So, operator, over to you. Thank you, Alexandra Witsi, Nature Magazine. Hi, thanks for taking my call. This is for Thomas. Um, one quick question: Did you say JWST was going to look for the impact? And then, secondly, and more important, can you talk a little bit more about the the deep space network needs, especially because uh, the Artemis folks, when they were talking about replanning the Artemis one launch attempt, that they needed to work around uh, around DART. How much of DSN time does DART take up over what period? Uh, so I'm I'm going to just give you the bottom line up front. I'm going to kick it over to you for uh, <clears throat> for web and uh, one of the systems engineers, perhaps on or or you on on the exact uh, uh, timing of of uh, Dart. So first of all, bottom line up front, you're you're exactly telling uh, you know you're, you're pointing what I what I did all last week or much of it at least, which is to coordinate uh, between, uh, you know, a huge agency priority, which is Artemis One, which uh, seeks to uh, depart the Earth at, you know, on the 23rd, which is uh, three days before, and uh, potentially, right, and this one. Uh, by the way, there's many more missions that are also needing and wanting to get the data down uh, from there. So, so what we're doing is going through just the way you would hope uh, we're doing this, kind of everybody in a room and, uh, and looking at, uh, at uh, the needs and the requirements that are there. Uh, what's really important for us is that we uh, look at it first kind of nominal on nominal, but then we look at contingency on nominal or contingency on contingency. Uh, what, what I mean with that, if something goes badly uh, on either DART or you know Orion, where where we really need to get all the data with the highest priority, it still has to work because of the requirement that I said earlier with DART, because uh, you know, later data getting data later down and you know later than it should be is not uh, is not uh, a solution. So why don't you tell us quickly, uh, anyone, uh, how many? Uh, days of uh, data we need full time, and uh, oh, uh, you know, just just quickly give those numbers. Yeah, so uh, we've had 24/7 coverage uh, since 30 days to impact, so we expect the 24/7 up until impact. So I think Artemis' is next launch date is the 23rd, our impact is the 26th. So uh, the last day we absolutely need the 24/7 coverage. Uh, one good thing about this is we're going to be in a different part of the sky than Artemis, so we shouldn't be competing too much for the resources. Uh, at the same time, it is absolutely critical that last day that we have 24-7 DSN coverage. Yeah, we're, we're all half right. Yes, go ahead. This is Bobby. Let me just add to that. Uh, there's the different plan of the sky issue, so we're largely in the southern hemisphere, um, whereas uh, Artemis would be in the northern hemisphere. Uh, we're also X-band, um, and Artemis is S-band, so there are different antennas at the different stations. So it's not as much of a direct conflict as you might, you know, at first blush imagine. So talk about James Webb. Uh, yeah, Nancy Chabot. Um, JWST will plan to uh, observe uh, the collision look at the Didymos system during DART's impact. And let me just stress here, this is not what JWST is designed to do, right? This is a challenging measurement for them. They're designed to look deep in space at things that are very far away. This is happening purposely when the distance between Earth and this asteroid system is minimized. This is only 11 million kilometers. So the tracking is fast, um, you know, but it makes sense. This is a unique opportunity and a unique moment to take all the resources that we possibly can to maximize what we've learned. So they will be looking. We'll see what they get. Thank you. Next question Thanks. from the operator. Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi. Good morning. Um, with the two uh, asteroids just a, over a half a mile apart, what are the chances that you hit Didymos, 
And if you did, would that pose any problems to Earth or anything else? And assuming you hit the morphous, how much ejected do you expect might come off, and is there any chance that the morphous could even split into multiple pieces, like big chunks and become multiple asteroids? Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah, Michelle. Go for it, Evan. Yeah. Um, this is Michelle Chen at APL. So I'm going to address the smart nav question, and I'll leave um, the hardest stuff to Evan and Nancy. But um, we have done so many simulations, and and again, varying the shapes and the conditions, um, and spacecraft feel. I mean, everything. And so we are optimistically confident um, that we're going to hit. Amorphous, and if we see it, you know, um, we should hit it. So as far as the, this is Nancy Chabot, APL, um, the amount of ejecta, if you wanted to ballpark it, of course we don't know specifically, which is why we're doing this test, um, but it's something like a million kilograms. Now, a million kilograms sounds like a lot, but the, you know, we don't know the mass specifically of Dimorphos either, but it's something like five billion kilograms. Um, and the mass of the spacecraft, to put this all into perspective, is 600 kilograms, okay? So the spacecraft is very small. Sometimes we describe it as running a golf cart into a great pyramid or something like that for Dimorphos. Um, this really is about asteroid deflection, not disruption. Um, this isn't going to blow up the asteroid. It isn't going to put it into lots of pieces. And in fact, the way that we're shifting Dimorphos is going to orbit ever so slightly, even closer, more gravitationally bound to Dynamos than it was prior to DART's collision little nudge that only changes its orbital period by 1%. So it's going to be pretty spectacular for sure, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't make any noticeable change in how Dynamos goes around the Earth or a threat to the Earth in any way. Janet, do you mind if I just add, uh, Thomas here? There is no scenario in which one or the other body can become a threat to the Earth. Uh, literally, it's just not scientifically possible with, uh, just because of momentum conservation and other things. Thank you. We'll take one more remote question. So, Operator, over to you. Nell, Greenfield Boyce, and NPR, your line's open. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to build on what Marcia asked. Um, you know, given that so this was, you know, discovered fairly recently and, 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 you know, in the grand scheme of things, and it sounds like there's a lot that is just not known about the composition of the asteroid. So could you run through, like, the various um, options for how, like, you know, what the structure of these bodies might be, rub rubble pile versus something else, and how that would affect, you know, what you guys see in terms of its, you know, change to its orbit? Thank you. Yeah, this is Nancy Chabot. So the Didymos uh, asteroid system was discovered in 1996, and people have studied it extensively since then. We know the spectral composition of the larger Medford Didymos, and it's an S-type asteroid. It's the most common type of asteroid in the near-Earth object space. It's like ordinary chondrite meteorites. We have samples of these. We study them in the lab. They're mixtures of metal and rock at an intimate mixture of early building blocks of the solar system, which is very exciting and not the topic of today's conversation. Um, Dimorphos we haven't seen, but the models for how binary asteroids form suggest that it's likely going to be the same material as Didymos. Um, and so we have good reason to believe that. It is exciting that Dimorphos is going to be the smallest asteroid that's ever been visited by a spacecraft. So what is the structure of these small asteroids? Are they rubble piles like these other ones that we've seen? Uh, most scientists would probably bet on the rubble pile rather than the coherent shard. Um, and that's, uh, that's one possibility. But again, I think to put this all into context, uh, you know, the DART spacecraft is very small still compared to Dimorphos, um, and this is just a small nudge. This is, this is what you would want to do for planetary defense. You're trying to just give something a small nudge, which only changes its position slightly, and that adds up to a big change in position over time. So if you were going to do this for planetary defense, you would do it 5, 10, 15, 20 years in advance in order for this technique to work. You're not trying to make yourself a problem where you destroy an asteroid and you make a lot of different pieces, um, and so this really is there. So we don't, um, to say we don't know anything about the asteroid system I think is, is, not, is not right. We actually know a lot about this asteroid system. We've been studying it for decades. We know the composition of the primary, um, but there's going to be a lot to learn here. So I think putting it in that context is important. I'm happy for anybody else who wants to chime in there. Yeah. Um, so this is Bobby. I'd like to just add a little bit. 
Um, so I want to go back to what this is. This is humanity's first planetary defense test mission, right? This is a test. We intend to learn from this test. Uh, we're taking uh, defense technology and flying it for the first time on the civilian application to ensure that we hit this target. Uh, we can't see the target today. That's incredibly exciting, right? We don't know uh, exactly what the target is made of, and we intend to learn uh, not only what it's made of, but how, um, how, how, what the potential is of this technology for future uh, kinetic uh, impacts. So, you know, everything about this is a test. It's being done in a safe manner. Um, there's a 0% chance, um, regardless of what the DART spacecraft does, there's a 0% chance that this asteroid could come towards the Earth. Um, and so it's actually an ideal setup uh, for our science team and for the engineering team, not just uh, on the DART mission, but those of us around the world, uh, to learn uh, and to make ourselves better uh, through this mission. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Hi. Uh, Sam Ahmed again from AFP. Um, perhaps for uh, Nancy or for Bobby, this is just a, the sort of high-level stuff we're talking about. What will a successful test mean for planetary defense and for the kin kinetic impact of models? Does it mean that, hey, we've, we're sorted now, we can do this? What will an unsuccessful test mean? And were we to be in this sort of cataclysmic situation, could you talk a little bit about the other options, the, um, uh, the sort of gravitational um, diversion uh, uh, idea or the uh, nuclear blast uh, idea? Could you talk about those a little bit? Thank you. Uh, this is Nancy. I think maybe uh, Planetary Defense Coordination Office. Uh, Andrea, do you want to take the lead on that sort of with the, the other what this means for planetary defense? Yeah, so the, the mission, uh, as Bobby said, it's, you know, it's a test mission. Um, this will give us all confidence that uh, deflection uh, technology could work in the future. Um, the data from this and um, the Chia Cube and the HERA mission, it all come together uh, to um, validate um, the scientific models and um, just overall provide us more confidence. Um, if it's, if it's uh, you know, misses, it still provides a lot of data. This is a test mission. This is why we test. We want to do it now um, rather than when there is an actual need. Um, so overall, uh, all this will feed into a greater knowledge and we'll understand better uh, potential viability for kinetic impact or mitigation, uh, you know, implementation. Um, the other methods. Um, so uh, this, this test mission falls into the mitigation strategy. There's the kinetic impactor mitigation, which this is it. There is the gravity tractor option, and then there's um, the nuclear option where something would be detonated next to an asteroid. Um, this kinetic impactor mitigation technology is, um, you know, really the most viable. The technology is the most developed. Um, the folks at APL understand how to operate the space spacecraft. Um, so this is why we're pursuing this mission. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com. I think also for Andrea or, or uh, Dr. Zuberkin. Um I'm just curious about the, the risk of, of asteroid impacts just in general, why we're doing this mission, you know, now uh, as opposed to, you know, 20 years ago or in the, in the future. You know, what? What is that threat of asteroid impacts to Earth now? I know that there have been surveys to find the biggest ones, um, but uh, I'm just curious what the, what the, the, the threat actually is uh, for the Earth and, and how these can help reduce that. Uh, so uh, overall, it's a very, very low risk um, for, for an impact. Um, they do, per, they do um, you know, give us uh, cause for concern because they could do, do damage. Um, you know, um, uh, planetary defense coordination office. Um, you know, this test is just one piece of it. Um, we're constantly looking in the skies um, for potential new asteroids and threats. And um, you know, overall, the size of um, Dimorphos is in a class that you know we're, we're most concerned about, about 140 
60 meters. Um, and so this test will help, uh, you know, give us confidence that we do have a mitigation strategy should a, should a you know, threat ever be identified. But there, there's a low probability of, of there actually being um, a threat. Yeah, so let me just add and Thomas here. Um, so we're not aware of a single object right now within the, uh, you know, next 100 years or so is really threatening the Earth. Uh, I'll also guarantee to you that if you wait long enough, there will be an object. Why do I know that? Because as we go for, look back in time, uh, these objects are half, uh, in fact, really affected our history. And you know, if we have uh, the geologic effort, uh, record to prove that, and, uh, and of course also uh, data from the moon and elsewhere uh, that, uh, that tell us that. Uh, we did this test uh, not because of a specific threat that is, or we started doing this test, not because of a specific threat that was there, but because we have uh, readiness of technologies and a good idea, which at the, at the very reasonable cost kind of actually allows us to move uh, the, the state of knowledge forward, uh, together with the international community that wants to follow up with a mission to really go help translate what we're learning into the scientific context, which is so important, as uh, uh, Nancy Chabot said. It's, it's, it's the right time to do this. So, so it's not kind of an external schedule that was uh, put on us. It's, it's more, uh, you know, it's just one of those cases where, where we're ready uh, uh, to do it. And, uh, and for me, I think uh, with the same priority, we really want to go look for all the objects of that size, uh, that are out there in the sky and just really make sure that uh, once we look at the other half or so of objects at 140 meters and above that we haven't yet observed, uh, that the statement I just made remains correct, which is in the next 100 years, there's a very, very low uh, priority for that. I just want to point out uh, something that's non obvious, and that is that uh, work uh, from Osiris Rex, for example, as well as other uh, kind of small body uh, type of missions have also added to the uh, forecasting accuracy uh, of, uh, of uh, such threatening uh, asteroids. For example, the uh, interaction of thermal, the thermal radiation and the orbit uh, that, is, uh, that uh, is, you know, actually really hard um, uh, to predict based on theoretical uh, uh, context uh, in the, uh, for OSIRIS-REx boss specifically measured and uh, being put in, uh, in, in context with uh, the observations of that body, which really helps us, together with the mass distribution in the asteroid belt, uh, which uh, we get to know better and better, to really knock down, if you want, the biggest uncertainties for orbit propagation over long periods. So the point is, yes, uh, this impact is what we want to do the, uh, uh, with uh, the NEO surveyor, really looking at all threats, but also really understanding the the science behind it that that really helps us uh, more with a more accurate predict you know more accurate kind of long term predictions as we go forward. Thank you. Next question. Hello, uh, Alejandro Redondo with uh, F. My question is: So, what comes next after these tests? Will you be doing more tests? Uh, because you said that there's a very low probability for you know an asteroid hitting the Earth in the next 100 years. So my question is that, what comes next after this? Do you plan on running more tests? Uh, what kind of, how, you mentioned a little bit about how this is going to help you uh, understand more these kind of systems, but yeah, that, what's next? So why don't I answer that again, Thomas uh, Serbokin here. Um, so first and foremost, we just got the, the decadal strategy from the planet planetary community, which is uh, from the academies, national academies with the, best scientists uh, both in the United States and internationally telling us what the priorities are. I want to tell you that for the first time in this uh, decadal strategy, actually planetary defense has been prioritized as one of the areas we should uh, uh, focus on very much. And that strategy also uh, actually endorses as the highest uh, priority first uh, to be done in this decade, kind of what I already mentioned, which is to really map out all the threats that are out there. The way we need to do that is go into space with an infrared camera because so many of these objects are really dark. Uh, they, they turn dark and kind of red, if you want, in space because of the interactions of the surfaces with the space environment that kind of tends to chemically alter uh, the surface. 
though, we need to go into space. You cannot do it from the ground where most of the objects have been observed so far and will continue to go forward. I was just, uh, I think, last year in Hawaii uh, looking at a ground uh, on Mount Haleakala, looking at uh, the facility that almost every night kind of discovers, you know, two to three uh, or sometimes even more of these objects uh, kind of by uh, really mapping mapping the sky with a lot of uh, fanciful uh, computer science to, to look at this. So we're going to continue uh, going that path on ground systems, but really look at uh, the mapping of these red, dark objects uh, from space. Thank you, Thomas. And this uh, is, sorry, this is Michelle Chen. I just want to geek out for a second and just say that from an engineer's perspective, um, with the technology demonstration of SmartNav, we are, like, super excited about the idea. And that, you know, that actually brings up a good point. I keep hearing the word technology, and, you know, Patrick, you mentioned Rosa at the top of the call. Perhaps are there any other technologies we'd like to highlight before going to the phone? Sure. So um, in addition, once again, this is Patrick Hill from APL. But in addition to the Rosa Solar Rays, which you guys are quite familiar with, they dwarf the spacecraft itself. We also have a radio line slot array, which is the high-gain antenna. This is a novel design for a, a, um, for a high-gain antenna that basically uses a leaky wave antenna design so that it, where energy leaks out of the circularly, circularly polarized to form a, a beam slot. So we're taking a technology that's being demonstrated on DART, and we're actually going to use that on our Dragonfly mission. So this is an example of where that technology is being tested out and we'll actually implement it on a on future mission. We also have uh, NASA's evol evolutionary uh, Xeon thruster, or the Next Sea thruster. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a solar electric propulsion system that basically accelerates Xeon. Um, this is, a, once again, a demonstration mission. We've demonstrated its ability to, to operate correctly early on in the, the DART mission. And then we also have the transformational solar array. These are a, a small batch of uh, IMM4 solar rays and reflectors that are actually embedded into the roads of solar rays. These produce five times the power and packing density uh, and, and once again are used, uh, ideally would be used on, on uh, outer planet exploration missions with large solar rays. And so we're, these are very exciting technologies that we're hoping to, that we are learning a lot about and hope to implement them into future missions. So. Thank you. We'll now go back to the phone for a few remote questions. Kenneth Chang, New York Times. Hi, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little about the um, It seems like that's why I'm sure I can't face energy and momentum anyway. Ken, I'm sorry, we're having trouble understanding you. Can you try repeating your question? Oh, sorry. I was just wondering if you talk about the scientific if you momentum energy, how is the properties of the asteroid in its perhaps the final Ken, um, we're still having trouble hearing you here in the room, but are you asking about the science of the asteroid? And the final is like determined by and Okay. People are pointing at just Nancy. People are pointing at me like, you take that one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um. It's like an email that's for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't think we really made out enough of there. I think maybe I heard something about energy and momentum and stuff like that as I was trying to um, do there, but I don't really have a sensible uh, answer to the question. So Maybe, I understand. can you just elaborate a little bit, Nancy, on what we, you, you mentioned what we know, and then specifically how we're going to understand post-impact, maybe the light curve observations and what that entails? Sure. Um, so some of the way that we're going to be able to figure out what happened, right? I mean, we've got the Draco images. This is going to give us the shape. We're going to try to use that to get the mass. We're going to see what this asteroid looks like. The ejecta is going to really be used in the models for what the internal structure is like. How strong is this asteroid? What is it made out of? Um, to see how much we move the asteroid, though, you need to use the telescopes here on Earth. And that's where, from the Earth, it only looks like a single point of light. 
Um, and what, but that brightness changes as Dimorphos passes in front of or behind Didymos. And so this light curve information from the telescopes on Earth, right now it takes 11 hours and 55 minutes. It's going to take maybe about 10 minutes less, um, and making that measurement will be the main way that we figure out the deflection. But all of this will feed then into these state-of-the-art impact models, dynamics models, to really understand the science behind, and then be able to be in a position to be, how do we potentially apply this going forward in the future? Thank you. Operator, next question. Jim Siegel, nasatech.net. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking uh, taking my call. Um, maybe I missed it earlier, but uh, one of you touched upon uh, Artemis and, and Orion, and um, I'm interested in what happens, if, if anything, uh, to this mission uh, if Artemis is, um, launches say on September 27th or um, maybe mid to late October. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Storbrook and uh, uh, here from the room. If it uh, launches uh, after the 26th, uh, the overlap is minimal. Uh, we're a lot more flexible getting from Lisa Q, for example, the data back uh, and uh, all the kind of time critical things are over. If it launches before the 26th, like on the 23rd, which is one of the dates that is outlined, nothing will happen either because we're doing the work right now to actually coordinate. So both of the missions are successful, which is our goal. We in science are equally excited about getting Artemis off the ground and making it successful as we are for our own mission. So uh, both will be successful uh, by the time we're, we're done and have everything planned. So if it's launching in, uh, in October, the same answer of course, applies that I said for the 27th, which is the, the overlap or kind of conflict is really uh, minimal or not existing at all. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. We'll come back. We'll come back to the room as a reminder for remote media. If you have a question, please press star one to be placed in the queue. Are there any questions in the room? Thank you. I've got two questions actually. One serious, one a bit more light. One. Um, Obviously, the DART mission is very different from an ASAT test, but there are some, some similar characteristics, and I'm just sort of anticipating some potential criticism that could come from countries like China and Russia. Can somebody explain how the debris that would be created by the DART spacecraft would not pose uh, a threat like one that, you know, we saw Russia test back in November, um, how this is, I guess, so far away? Uh, and such a small amount that it would be very different than that type of debris field. And then uh, my second question, just because this is something that I've been asked about quite a bit, uh, Bruce Willis, I know he was invited to the launch and wasn't there. Has he been invited again for, for impact? Thank you. I can answer the second question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take the first one? Sure. Yeah, so this is uh, Bobby Braun. So um, uh, our system and our spacecraft are not orbiting the Earth. Right. They're in heliocentric orbit about the sun. So this is in no way an ASAT test, right? A the, the events that you were referring to occurred in uh, low Earth orbit, right? And so they impacted other Earth spacecraft or satellites and and even the International Space Station a little bit. Uh, we're very far away from um, all the Earth, Earth-oriented spacecraft, right? So that's 11 how million this, kilometers. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so that's how this is different, right? We're not in orbit about the Earth. We're in orbit about the sun. We uh, also expect most of the debris because um, it has Didymos is so large and Dimorphos. People have modeled this, and it'll gravitationally fall back onto those two asteroids with time is the expectation. But again, the 11 million kilometers, and this is not in low Earth orbit, is the important point here. Thank you, uh, Tarek Malik for space.com. I, I think this might be for, for Nancy or, or for Bobby. Uh, you mentioned just the, the anticipation of seeing those images come in, I think one a minute uh, is, is what you said. There. One a second. One a second, One yes. a second, yeah. And I can imagine that the public would get really excited to have a way to see that as well. Will there be like a, an actual website that, that you, you can direct people it's to? It's going to be live on NASA TV. Yeah. 
but, but in, like in terms of like a website where they can download it themselves in those last few hours, is, is there going to be something like that for them to do? Thank you. you mean rather than just watch it on the broadcast? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's going to broadcast is, I'll let you take this, but I mean, the broadcast is going to be on the Internet, right? I mean, so go on the Internet. Yeah, Derek, and watch Derek it. the current plan <laughs> is just to stream that live footage on NASA TV and the agency's YouTube and social media channels. Um, we do have one more remote question, so operator, over to you. Eileen Woodward, Wall Street Journal. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. I had two questions. One, Nancy, can you reiterate what dimorphous is mass is? And two, if in the weeks following the impact, the telescope calculations indicate that you don't see the orbital change um, that you anticipated to see, do you think that would mean that there will be more focus in the future on other potential planetary defense techniques that maybe Andrea looked at earlier in this call, or will you just try again? Uh, I'm sorry, what did Demorphous you get? Dimorphous is mass. Oh, uh, Dimorphous is mass is not specifically known, right, because we don't know the shape, but if you use something like an ordinary chondroid or other asteroids that we've seen and you make approximations, you would say Dimorphos' mass is about 5 billion kilo kilograms, so 5 billion kilograms. Roughly, we don't really know. We're going to find out, but something like that. Um, if DART collides with Dimorphos and then you don't see any orbital period change, this would be exceptionally surprising because even if there's no ejecta, just the amount of momentum that DART is bringing in on its own from the weight of the spacecraft slamming into Dimorphos is enough mm -hmm. to shift its orbit in a measurable way because the telescopes are very good at making this measurement. Um, how much we shift it is really what uh, the measurement that we're looking to make, and that's related to how much ejecta comes off, how the asteroid, uh, this real asteroid, interacts with the DART spacecraft. Um, so. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Um, yeah, just uh, it, it's sort of trying to reference what I uh, asked earlier, but this arm from AFP. Um, if this is successful, can you get something much bigger? Can you get something which is, you know, a, a 10 mile wide asteroid, for example? Can, it, it, it's, it's all known physics. If this works out, why, you know, can you do that? So I, I think it's it's good to put this into perspective. So for the near-Earth object population, things that are like 10-kilometer size, there are four of those. We have found all of them. We are tracking them. None of them are a threat for the foreseeable future. So this is great, right, because that's like the mass extinction event, the killing the dinosaurs sort of thing. Um, for things that are about a kilometer, actually, there's a lot more of those in the population, but we found over 95% of them are tracking them. None of them are for a threat for the foreseeable future. It's these few hundreds of meter-sized objects where none of them are known to be a threat for the foreseeable future, but we have found less than 50% of that population currently. And so it makes sense to be talking about this from a planetary defense perspective, something that's a few hundred kilometers. Wouldn't wipe out a global extinction event, but the regional devastation could be the size of a city or a small state or a small country. And so it is very devastating, very rare, no known threat, but that's why the focus a lot of time is on objects of that size and why Dimorphos is such a perfect target for this first planetary defense test mission because it's this size that you're most concerned about for planetary defense. But, Andrea, maybe you want to provide any other perspective there for a planetary defense? Um, as far as... Um, uh, I mean, so... <laughs> I'm trying to think how to say this. Um, you know, Nancy talked about that this is a, the target size that we're looking for, and it could do you know some, some damage. And so we're we're looking. Thomas mentioned the Neo Surveyor Telescope, and so that's one of our next planetary defense missions where we're going to be looking for this class of asteroids, which Nancy talked about, that we haven't found yet. Um, and so doing this test, you know, it provides us the data of a possible mitigation. Um, method and uh, of a class that's important to us um, to understand. Thank you. And we have time for a few more questions, if there are any in the room. Thank you. Uh, George Berkheimer with the Business Monthly. 
I was just wondering um, how much this might be able to tell us about the chemical composition uh, of the asteroid and uh, whether any of that information we would be getting from spectrometers would be useful to uh, commercial space flight operations. So DART is a very, this is Nancy Chabot, uh, APL. DART is a very focused spacecraft. It has Draco. Draco is an optical camera that's going to come zooming in and take some spectacular pictures. Leachia Cube has two cameras on it. One of it does take um, some filtered images in RGB, red, green, blue, and so they'll get some spectral information from that. Um, they're just a close flyby, though, right? Like they take their data and then they're long gone. Uh, so we will get some information. Telescopes also have the ability to take spectral measurements and they'll be able to get some, but it's hard for Dimorphos specifically, because Didymos is so close and so much bigger, it pretty much swamps the signal for most telescopes. Um, the great thing is that there's HERA. So the European Space Agency has the HERA mission, which will rendezvous with this system. So not just fly by, but stay there in that system. And they are equipped with a, a more scientific payload because of that rendezvous capability. And they have two CubeSats as well. And so they will really be able to get some great chemical information on these objects. and. Uh, and DART and HERA working together really is going to teach us more than e uh, any one of those on their own could. And so we're working closely with those teams. HERA team members are on the DART investigation team. DART investigation team members work on the HERA team. So um, eventually we will get this great chemical information because of this international collaboration in particular. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? All right. That will bring us to the end of our briefing. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you again to our panelists for learning more. And thank you uh, for joining us today at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory to learn more about this incredible mission of FIRST. Uh, as a reminder, be sure to tune in on Monday, September 26th at 6 p.m. to NASA TV for live coverage of DART's terminal approach with the asteroid Dimorphos. You can also follow along with the mission at nasa.gov slash DART mission or at the mission website, dart.jhuapl.edu. And if we didn't have an opportunity to get to your question today, please feel free to reach out to me, Joshua Handel, for response. Thank you again. Conference is concluded. Please disconnect at this time.